Ladies and gentlemen, colleagues, let me welcome you to the second workshop of the excellent scientific project DIME, Dynamic Models in Economics. DIME is a joint project of the Faculty of Informatics and Statistics, University of Economics, Prague, at the Faculty of Social Sciences, the Faculty of Mathematics and Physics, and Center for Economic Research and Graduate Education, all from Charles University in Prague, and the uh, Institute of Information Theory and Automation, Academy of Sciences, uh, Czech Republic, uh, which is financially supported by the Czech uh, Science Foundation. Uh, currently, the project is in the third year of solution uh, work on the project in 2013 took place within nine cooperative groups, which were divided into three research branches. This is here. Uh, dynamic macroeconomics, optimal economic uh, decision making, and financial econometrics and risk management. The members of the working groups uh, were simultaneously employees of those institutions. In uh, 2013, the work on the project was attended by 39 researchers <coughs> and uh, 33 students. 25 papers in impact journals were published, both in leading domestic journal as well as in well-established and top-level uh, foreign journals. Uh, 13 papers were accepted for publication in impact journals and 23 papers were submitted into impact journals. Uh, four chapters in books and two books were published. Uh, the project members also participated in many international and domestic conferences and within the framework of this project we were able to invite uh, prominent foreign, foreign colleagues. Dear colleagues, uh, let me welcome the distinguished guest, Professor Hashem Besaran. Here, uh, we work, uh, we know the work of Professor Besaran for many years, and uh, we had desire to meet him and to listen to his lecture in person. We started to discuss the possibility of his visit two years ago. Uh, I informed Professor Besaran about our project and it seemed to him interesting. And now I'm very glad that Professor Besseran is here. I'm also glad to announce that his lecture, Debt, Inflation and Growth, will be followed by lectures of three members of our the project, uh, Tomáš Hovránek, Josef Baronik, and Michal Pakoš. Professor Hashem Besseran is the John Elliott Chair of in economics and a professor of economics at the University of Southern California, where he is also the director of USC, Northern Pacific Center for Applied Financial Economics. He is emeritus professor of economics at the University of Cambridge. He is a fellow of uh, the British Academy, fellow of the Econometric Society, and fellow of the Journal of Econometrics. Uh, Professor Pesaran is a founding editor of Journal of Applied Econometrics and co-developer of Microfit and Econometric Software Package published by Oxford University Press. Uh, he is Thomson Reuters Citation Laureate in Economics from 2013. Uh, Professor Pesaran is a leading expert of applied econometrics. He studies quantitative, uh, quantitative analysis of financial markets energy demand and the Middle East economy. His work has been published in more than 170 academic publications and 13 books. The main areas of his research include, for example, national and global macroeconometric modeling, empirics of growth, economic and financial forecasting in the presence of structure breaks, financial econometrics, Econometric analysis of, uh, analysis of panel data, unit root testing, and co-integration in uh, panel data modeling. Uh, in one interview, Professor Pesan says that very impressed me 
I develop methods because they help me solve concrete problems, not the other way around. So please, Professor Besseran. Thanks so much. Uh, very kind of introduction. I don't know whether you can hear me from the back. That's why I wanted to say that uh, it's, yeah. OK. I try to speak louder. Can you hear me now? OK. Uh, thanks again. Uh, I, it would be great to be back in uh, Prague. I was here in exactly the same building, I think, about two years ago. We had a very nice conference on forecasting here. But uh, it's the first time I have uh, been uh, talking to the faculty and uh, students here. I also look forward to the uh, presentations follows after me. I often learn more from others than myself. So I look forward to that. Uh, now, um, this paper, uh, I, uh, I thought maybe it's interesting to talk about because both has got policy implications for the current European crisis, but also it's got some of the, shows how we can use some of the uh, econometric techniques we have been developing to answer a substantial question. And what are the challenges uh, in, in, in doing so? And this work is joined with Alex Chodik who is in uh, one of my students, oh, actually all the three of my students happen to be, uh, uh, Mohades and uh, Mehdi Raisi. Uh, they have done most of the hard work, as usual. Uh, now, uh, what the, 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 let me just go uh, directly to the issues and the problems. Uh, I want to finish uh, on time, hopefully, and have more uh, discussion and some questions. And uh, as I said, May I present? Please do interrupt me if you want to have clarifying questions that you have as I go along. It helps me to understand uh, how better to present my work. So the issue is that the relation between death and growth has been very topical, especially after the recent financial crisis. Uh, and uh, there have been a number of studies who, who look at uh, this connection and what we decided to do is to uh, consider more econometrics and more rigorous, may I, if I may use that word, a way of looking at the problem. Because when I study some of the empirical analysis of the relation between death and growth, uh, published by some often eminent economists, I found that there are one thing, there are problems associated with them, which I'm going to mention later on. So we said, OK, it's a challenge for you. If you don't like what others do, what would you do it yourself? So that's what I'm going to suggest how we, we did it. The first thing we realized that uh, the most important relationship uh, to look at is not the short-run relationship between debt and growth, but it's more the long-run relationships. Let me explain to you why that's the case, then we move on. Well, uh, from the time of Keynes, we understand the business cycle, and we know that when we get a negative shock and the economy goes during downswing, uh, the output uh, falls, investment falls, consumption may fall not that much, but the output and investment fall. And during that time, because of the automatic stabilizers in the economy, uh, the taxation falls and the benefit to the, the government expenditure do not fall. Which basically means debt would rise and output would fall, so therefore debt to uh, GDP would fall. So the fact that debt to GDP falls during a business cycle sorry, rises, debt to GDP rises during business cycle is something to be expected, not to be worried about. Why should we worry about? We know it's exactly going to happen. So the question then arises is whether when that uh, uh, cyclical effect of debt to GDP arises, would it correct itself? Would it, as the economy starts recovering, debt to GDP goes back to what its equilibrium was before, and then, or not? And what is the consequences of the debt to GDP remaining on an unsustainable way high, and then what are, are the negative effects on output growth? So that's what we wanted to identify, <coughs> uh, the very important issue. But then we, we also realized that there are many differences across countries in institutional, political setups, and the way they treat debt in those economies differ. For example, we know Japan has debt to GDP of 170%. But nobody worries about Japan, and interest rate is the lowest in the world, and the long-term rate is lower than anywhere else. But then you have countries who debt to GDP rises about 80, 70 percent, and they may expose themselves to uh, foreign exchange problem, financial crisis. So there are heterogeneity across countries. Uh, so we cannot assume 
the same model or the same parameter coefficient across all these economies. And secondly, there are spillover effects uh, that debt uh, to GDP effects uh, when happens in one country, it could have implication for other countries which trade with them. And therefore, we need to take into account the interconnections of the economies. So with these uh, two issues in mind, uh, we also look at uh, what are the uh, countries that which they cannot have debt. For example, my own country, Iran, they can't possibly borrow in the financial market because of financial uh, sanctions, and they have very little connection, so they can't possibly have debt. Uh, so what happens, they print money. So therefore, we realize in some countries, the, because of the structure, is inflation, which could be a problem, rather than debt in those economies. So we also, when you look at many countries, you need to take into account not what happens to the debt to GDP, but also what happens to inflation and how that affects the growth rate. So we decided it's important to consider the joint effects of debt and inflation on growth. Uh, it's very important when you deal with many countries, as I'm going to look at. So because of countries are heterogeneous, therefore it's important to allow for both possibilities. In some cases, debt becomes important in, in some countries, and in other cases, inflation becomes important. So that is very important to take both into account. Uh, when, uh, the, if you look at the empirical literature, they basically focus on advanced economies and they look at debt. Uh, obviously, when you look at emerging economies or uh, developing economies, you need to take into account uh, inflation uh, as a consequence of the, some of the problems uh, in managing the public uh, debt. So, just to summarize, uh, as we go forward, uh, we, we need to allow for cross-country differences. They matter. Debt, inflation, and growth are not the same relationship across all countries. Some countries use debt financing, some countries use money printing financing, and some in mixture. So it was clear to me that you really need to allow for heterogeneity. Uh, the, I raised the issue of heterogeneity back in uh, uh, 1995 in a paper, which took five years to publish, by the way. A lot of people, young people, tell me, oh, you have easy, you always get published quickly. I said, it's not true. Every time you have a new idea that the profession doesn't like, it takes five years. Uh, and you have to persevere. Uh, you get it there. And uh, the reason was most people didn't have in, in economics, in panel data analysis, they believe that if you put a fixed effects or it just intercept different across countries or across firms, uh, the rest is not important. We showed uh, back in 1995, which was published over chronometrics, which has created a whole new literature, some of which I'm going to talk about, we showed that actually it's not true that if you have heterogeneity and dynamics, especially when you take two interacts, you get misleading answers if you ignore that uh, source of heterogeneity. Misleading in such a way that if you have infinite amount of data, still you make mistakes. Uh, so that's one of the issues. So one of the, one of, some of the work I'm going to talk about, it built from that work which I did back in 1990, which, as I said, took five years to publish. But then most of them, you will see that if you don't allow for them, you get misleading uh, uh, con conclusions <coughs> out of them. So that's what was, we knew, because of we look at the dynamics of debt to GDP, debt effects not a static, it's a dynamic effect. It takes time before it ma manifests itself. Initially, when debt to GDP rises, it's not important, as I explained during business time. So what matters is the dynamics of the debt to GDP, not just the debt to GDP. So because of that, it's very important to look at uh, cross differences. Then the more recently, we all became aware that when you look at the global economy, there are common factors in the global economy. Some of these common factors could arise because of political developments. What's happening, say, in one, in Middle East? What happened in Latin America? What happened in China? Some of them in common effects, like price of oil uh, moving up and down, affects all countries, but with different degrees. Some countries are affected positively by rising oil prices, like Norway, like some of the oil exporting countries. Many other countries are affected negatively. But not all countries are affected the same by the oil price changes. So there are heterogeneity and there's common effects. Now these are observed common factors, but there are many factors which are unobserved. Like when you enter uh, European integration, many factors are there which is common across those countries who integrate, but you cannot measure them. You cannot all identify those effects. So what, therefore, we have to deal with unobserved common effects. Uh, so that has been a very important area. And uh, how do you deal with unobserved common effects? If you don't unobserve things, how do you know what are their effects? Well, it turns out you have a look at one country at a time, 
you definitely cannot answer the problem. If you look at uh, Czech Republic only, and you have an observed common effects which affects the, your country, if you look at don't just the country itself, you will never be able to find out the importance of those effects. But if you look at the Czech Republic within the European economy, and between the global economy in particular, by averaging across many other countries, those effects can be identified through other countries. Because if a phenomena, uh, which is unobserved, affects all of us in this room, if I average all the effects on this room, so I will be able to figure out what that common effect is. So that's basically what the market does. I came to, across this idea when I was actually working, looking at the financial market, that what the financial market does, it averages the private uh, information from individuals. So when you look at the price, to some extent, that summarizes, uh, not fully, as uh, Stiglitz and uh, uh, Grossman pointed out back in 1980, that it doesn't fully reveal all the uh, effects, but it does, to some approximation, uh, reveal that. So what we're going to do in the area of looking at uh, cross-sectional dependence, uh, which, uh, the factors which uh, make countries relate to each other, we are going to use cross-section averages of many countries in order to model or proxy the effect of unobserved components. So we're just using averages of other countries to proxy the common factors. And then finally, nonlinearities. In many problems, nonlinearity may not matter. Uh, but we look at the consumption income relation at the aggregate level, I don't think nonlinearity is that important. But when you look at the, some other problems like debt to GDP and effects on growth, it matters because we all know, we discussed it as the, when the recession happened, debt to GDP rises. Uh, and then after some time, it may then uh, settle back to its normal level. But what if it keep going up for whatever reason? Debt to GDP keep rises, if it above a threshold, if it goes above certain level, it may trigger different, uh, if you like, uh, reaction mechanism. Because of that, there is a threshold effect. It was pointed out by uh, Reinhardt uh, uh, and Ro uh, Rockefeller and Reinhardt, which we're going to talk about. So therefore, nonlinearity is important. In fact, I'm going to go back to their work and see whether what they derived was correct. There was a lot of controversy about their work because they said that they use a the wrong spreadsheet and so on. But I'm not going to address those issues. They are not that important, uh, despite the fact it was discussed in the uh, you know, uh, public press. But it turns out that the, me the method they use is defective, in my opinion. I had corresponding with him, which is agrees, because they didn't allow for heterogeneity. Uh, heterogeneity is very important. Again, the threshold effect may differ across countries. <coughs> so the key issues are heterogeneities, dynamics, and commonalities which are not observed. We need to address it. Let's just see how we're going to uh, address this. Uh, as I said, some of these uh, developments are going on for a number of 20 years now. So uh, basically, we use an autoregressive distributor like model, some of you may have used, which I have shown in some of my work, uh, what's called ARDL model, which, which does the dynamics. What is interesting about these ARDL models is that I'm going to explain, which is not as understood as as appreciated, that by putting enough dynamics, you can get rid of the endogeneity problem. So every time I have endogeneity, I can put enough dynamics to get rid of it uh, in, in some context. Uh, so we use ARDL to deal with dynamics, uh, and, uh, to some, and in some cases, heterogeneity. Uh, sorry, heterogeneity, as well as some cases, endogeneity. Then we're using the, uh, the cross-section averages, CS, the cross-section averaging method, in order to deal with the problem of commonality, which, and also some endogeneity, which comes from commonality. And then we finally, in this, in this paper, we suggest another method which uh, allows us to estimate the long run without worrying about the short run effect, which is more robust than ARDL. So I'm going to talk about ARDL, cross-section uh, cross uh, uh, augmented ARDL, which is basically, see whether I can use the, that's it. Cross-sectionally, this is cross-sectionally augmented ARDL. So we use ARDL estimate for each country separately, then they cross-sectionally add them by cross-section averages, uh, which is now we showed in a very recent paper that we would deal with the dynamics and also deal with commonalities. Then we, in this particular paper, we come up with a new method, 
which we don't use ARV, but we use only distributed lag, but I'll show you the advantage of it, it allows us to have more robust uh, estimation of some of the misspecification could arise when you use ARDL. For example, when you use ARDL, you need to know the dynamics, uh, the order of the autoregressive and distributed lag. You may misjudge it. Suppose you mistake the, the autoregressive distributed lag orders. What we show that this method is robust to this kind of misspecification. Uh, although the, in every method you use in life, there are pros and there are cons. Uh, method A could help you along this direction, method B along the other direction. So there is no method which dominates. I'm going to explain the differences these methods, and hopefully we will see whether, whether the results are actually to what extent they reflect this. Okay, and then we will uh, look at uh, the uh, look at the, as I already explained jointly the modeling of inflation, debt, and growth, and then we use panel of countries. Over a, quite a long period of time, we, we only have annual data on long period of, on long series. Uh, the data, some of them come from uh, the, the, the IMF, uh, I'll explain that later on. Some come from Rogoff, uh, Reinhardt sources, and so on. And let's go back to that. So that's what we're going to look at all these now more theoretical and more detailed issues. Discuss some more color. I always believe whenever you have a method, when you want to apply it, you need to find out to what extent uh, in, they work in a small sample. Uh, because, you know, I've seen many methods people develop which they say it's asymptotically works, but we don't know what type of time periods, what time cross-section data you need in order for it to work. So I'm, going, I'm not going to show you there's not enough time. Uh, I took them all out uh, for this presentation, but it's in the paper. But I'm going to show you the summary of the results to convince you that this method actually works in a small sample. Uh, and then we look at the literature of the, 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 what empirical evidence we have so far. We use the new data, get empirical, new empirical results. Uh, I, I don't want to call, uh, spend too much time. Why is it long run relations are important? I've already explained to you in the case of debt to GDP. It's really, it's no point worrying about the short and dynamics relation between debt to GDP and cycle. I mean, this is going to happen anyway. So more important than the long run. Uh, so let me just now tell you something about which uh, some of you may not be familiar with. So a lot of you use, uh, I noticed from the, some of the research topics, using uh, VARs or using structural VARs, using DSGE model, which are built on VAR. So all used to the vector autoregressive model to analyze. And we say, why do I use ARDL, uh, despite the fact that uh, people, a lot of people use VAR? The reason is when you do the long-run relationship, you don't need a VAR. The VAR is very important when you want to look at all the short and dynamics. Let me explain to you very quickly. Suppose you have a VAR, I'll choose the order one, but you can believe me, I can do any order, it doesn't really matter. It's just simply, I choose two variables because it's simple enough to point out the results, but you can easily show that it works for many variables. So the simplest VAR is order one, and there are two variables. Now, if I live with two variables, now I, the, the whole point of the VAR is how do you model the correlation between the error, the shock, or the error of the equation for y and the shock, exp, of equation for x. So therefore, is the correlation between these two matters. Now suppose now I model, the, denote the correlation between the errors of the equation for y and the error of the equation for x by omega variance of exp. This is just a scaling. You can always write the correlation in terms of the variance of exp. I think that helps us to uh, calibrate. And omega is basically the, it is to do with the degree of dependence. Uh, so if you then, you know it's very easy, if you run a, uh, like a projection of a EY on EXT, you, you can write it as a WEXT, which is that, this is the, uh, come from this notation, you become omega, so that omega EXT plus UT. So the dependence can be modeled in terms of a regression of the error of Y on error of X. It's well known. Uh, people have noted that ages ago. And then what matters is that now UT, which is the new error, uh, would be orthogonal to EXT. So these two errors are now orthogonal by construction. If you have a Gaussian uh, errors, they would be exact relationship. Uh, so that's very easy. So then what you do, you just say, OK, you have now orthogonality of you given EXT by this construction, this new error. Now I can go back and uh, basically replace EYT in this equation, in the first equation for Y. So I get, this is the VAR, but now I've written it so that I bring the contemporary dependence into the 
omega e x t plus a new error. And I know these two errors are orthogonal to each other. Now I know what e x t is. e x t is given by the error of the first equation, I, which is given by this. The first equation is this. I put it back in here, solve out the, the, the various things. What do I get? I get the equation, which is a r 1 d l 1, a r d l 1. So I get the a r d l 1, but notice the new error, u t, is orthogonal to x. So I can estimate this r d 1 by OLS. It's not magic, it just comes from the relationship now. I've noted that in 1999, but it, uh, you know, a lot of people are still say, well, where is it coming from? It's very easy. You can. Now, of course, if I increase the number of lags, what happens? More lags in here. So therefore, if I put enough lags in this model, if the model was originally a var, I put enough lags, I can always uh, get rid of indigeneity by putting enough dynamics. Now, you may say, why is it people don't do it when they want to model short and dynamics? The answer is, look at this coefficient. This coefficient phi is not phi 1, 1 and phi 2, 1, or beta is not the same. So you cannot identify the dynamics from this equation. Well, I mean, you could, but this is not the most convenient way. But what matters, the long run relationship, which is given by this, is totally identified from this equation. Because the long run relation is beta 0 plus beta 1 divided by minus phi. That's what the long run relation is. And that's exactly identified. We show in the paper also, if you start with the wall and shock one of these equations permanently, uh, you will get exactly the same answer. So therefore, if your interest is in the long run relationship, there's no point working with the wall. It's a useless thing to do, because you're estimating so many other parameters which you are not interested in. You're in yeah, the, if you're interested in short run dynamics, like a shocking the economy and what happens to the rest, that's in the short run. Impulse response. Impulse response are short run phenomena. They are not long run. If the model is a station in the long run, the effect of the shock would go to zero or goes to equilibrium. It's exactly what's going to happen. What I'm interested in this paper is a long run relationship. It's therefore, ARD is the right thing to do. Okay? So that's the first thing. So but now life becomes very easy now. I can model uh, the, the long run relation by using the ARDL. What it turns out now, suppose I've got more dynamics. Lots of dynamics here. Now I'm going, allow, I allow for heterogeneity. So I've got countries now. You see, I put an I here for countries. I have N countries. Now I've got the time periods. Now I've got, uh, now I've generalized the dynamics to have more lags. And I allow for the, the country I to have a different number of lags for, of the Y and different number of lags of the X. So I allow for a lot of heterogeneity now. So I allow for the dynamics of the countries to differ, the impact effects of the countries to differ, the short-term dynamics to differ. Uh, we, we can also uh, impose restriction if we believe the long run is the same across all these countries. I've done a paper, it's called Pullman Group Estimation in JASA, uh, which will look at that. But in the case of the debt, I've already argued that there is no reason why the long run debt to GDP to be the same across all countries. Because of the institution, because of the financial system, political system, there is no reason why it should be the case. While if you deal with the person in power parity, you may say you get the same long run relations. If you deal with Fisher uh, uh, parity in, in, in relation between inflation and uh, interest rate, you may get similar relation across countries, but not when you're dealing with the debt to GDP or the effect of inflation. As I explained, in the case of Iran, there is no effect of debt to GDP on uh, growth because there is no debt as such. But inflation is very important, uh, as we know. So basically, because of this, we allow for the long run to differ across countries. So our aim is to estimate this. Now, we have it for each country separately. But now we deal with the common effects. These are the common effects. The factor, FTs are the common factors, which enter the UT, which ties up all the countries together. Now, we do allow F to be correlated with X. Imagine you estimated this ARDL model for Czech Republic. But then ignore the FT. Because you, you, you're, only dealing, you're only looking at the Czech economy. You're ignoring the fact Czech is in the euro area, you, not euro area, but the euro economies and also the rest of the world. What happens, you're leaving this FD out. Now, if F is correlated with X, you get inconsistent estimates. You're like omitted variables. But if you model a Czech within the whole of the rest of the world, including the euro, then we're going to show you that you can use other countries' information to estimate F. 
and then plug it back in there, and then when you estimate the model for check, you get in a consistent estimate. So that's what the cross-section average comes in now. So I'm going to put in the cross-section averages of the y's and the x's back into the model. We have a paper, it's quite technically demanding to go through why it works. It, it looks like magic to a lot of people, especially my students, I tell them they don't believe it. They say, why don't you do a Monte Carlo? Easiest way. <laughs> if they do it, it works, they come, they do the theory then. Uh, so, so basically, so the idea is, we, the reason is we are interested in the average of the long run effects, and then we use ARDL, and there is a number of papers. I originally wrote a paper in Econometrica 2006, and the more recent paper is, uh, is, is just being reviewed, uh, submitted to the journal, which is uh, provide the evidence. The original paper, which we did in two thousand, I did in 2006, didn't allow for dynamics. It was easier problem. It was difficult enough, but it was much easier problem. But then now we have dynamics, heterogeneity, and cross-dependence. You see, that, that becomes a bit more difficult. But then we show, building some other work out done, that you can prove that it works. Now, what is interesting is that when you do ARDL with the cross-section averages augmented, it's also uh, valid whether the uh, regressors are I0 or I1. Uh, a lot of people who know about the integrated, this, uh, whether the process are stationary, the excess are stationary or not, they worry about this. But it turns out you shouldn't really worry about it in ARDL. Uh, we have another paper which shows that whether X's are I0 or I1 doesn't really matter because if X's are I, I, I1, Y becomes I1, so long as you have the, uh, you can run the regression under certain condition, you can get a, uh, the same uh, consistent estimate. In fact, is the, the, the estimate that works better. Uh, so so what the, they also showed that we can, as I said, there's another paper by Song, which is a student of Bob, who also tried to use similar ideas but using factor models, uh, so principal component models. Now, we, uh, we also try to estimate the, the model by uh, uh, another method which we're going to talk about, uh, which is basically, uh, we're going to deal with some of, these, some of the efficient deficiencies of this model. What is the problem with the ARDL augmented with cross-section averages? The problem is the dynamics. Because remember, the dynamics comes from the sum of all the uh, lag dependent coefficients. Go back to here, this is the denominator. One minus that. If this sum become near one, it's not surprising this ratio blows up. You get problem. So therefore, as you get near the unit root in the bottom, in the, along here, it becomes a problem. But it turns out in the growth model, because we deal with the output growth, the dynamics of output growth is not very, very persistent. At most, we get 60% uh, persistence. Is the output itself is persistent, but output growth is not persistent. So that is not a problem. But I thought I mentioned that in, the, in general. So you need large T to deal with it. Now, what we did then in this paper, we decided to go another way. We, I realized the most, the most difficult problem is the dynamics come from the lag-dependent variables. That's what the, uh, screwed things up. Anybody who does a VAR or anybody who has a, a dynamic model, they know that if you run a regression of Y on lag Y, you get a BIOS estimate. And the BIOS is one, oh, order 1 over T. And you cannot get rid of the BIOS, you see. So basically, in order to deal with it, what we did here, uh, we then said, why don't we just get rid of all the lag Ys? Get rid of all the lag Ys. How do you get rid of all the lag Ys? Go back to this model, write this as a lag operator, like a lag operator on Y by T, inverse a lag operator, so you get all the, uh, because of all the roots of this are stable and under this model setting. So you get rid of all the lag wires, but then you get much more complicated dynamics, infinite order dynamics for the x, and you introduce serial correlation in the errors. People didn't do it because they didn't know how to deal with serial correlation in the errors. But in the paper I published in 2006 in Econometrica, I'm going the wrong way. This one. I showed that if you put cross-section averages in this panel model, you shouldn't worry about uh, serial correlation. Again, it looks like magic, but it's true. The reason is that, let me explain to you why it happens. Take, take a, a number of errors, which all of them individually serial correlated. Average it. If the dependent across these errors is small, what happened to this average? Average goes to zero. It's like a law of large number. If you have a, if you, a cross-section average, uh, a number of variables which are not that correlated with each other, they are independent, it's obvious, goes to zero. 
So therefore, whether the individual is very serocorrelated or not doesn't matter because the average is go to zero. If the average go to zero, serocorrelation is not the issue. That's what happens. So if you then go back to this model, we showed that actually if you then estimate the model which put in just uh, like this one, is just put get rid of the, the dynamics, I get, no, sorry, I'm getting rid of the, the, the dynamics of the y through the lag value, but the dynamics enter in the x now, under factors. If you do all of that, you get a new equation, which basically you don't need to worry about uh, lag y's, you run a regression of y on x, and, uh, and you're putting lag changes of x, and you don't worry about serial correlation because you put cross-section averages, so you can identify the long run without modeling the dynamics of the y. You see, there is no lag y in here anymore. I got rid of it. But it doesn't really matter. That gives me the most robust estimate of the long run. This is really the con theoretical contribution of this paper, which wasn't observed anywhere else uh, in the literature. Now you see how it works now, the interesting how it works. So what, uh, there, there is a theory. Then we show there's a, there's all the algebra. What we show that actually these estimators uh, go to the true value uh, uh, when n and t become large and p become large. But so long as the a root of square of n p root power t rho is some the number between 0 and 1 goes to 0, which basically means that you will be all right if the lag order you set is uh, t to power 1 over 3. Because, because of this, this is quite actually a complicated theory to prove, but it tells us what lag order should be. Remember, by getting rid of the lagged y, I introduce a lot of lags in x. So I need to know where to stop, how many lags of x I need to put in. And the number of lags of x tells us to be t to power 1 over 3. In other words, as t becomes larger and larger, you need to put more and more lags. But it's not uh, that in our case, if you put lags 2 is enough, because if, uh, if t was, uh, I, I, I'm not very good at taking uh, one, uh, a cubic uh, um, of the numbers, but uh, I know if you do a computer, for example, if you have p100, uh, t100, uh, p2 or 3 is enough in, in most of these applications. So that's a theory. So when we go back to see what this theorem says, it says that you run a regression of y on lagged excess and the lag changes of excess and the cross-section augmented to pick up the effect of the f, which is now f tilde. So uh, then the model you put into cross-section averages. What are these cross-section averages is given by, by this e expression here. This is z bar. And what are the z bar? Z bar is y bar and x bar. And what is y bar and x bar? is weighted average of the eight countries. But we use 1 over n as weighted average. We also use PPP, GP weight as averages. So basically, you do that. And then you get rid of the, the cross dependence. And you can either estimate things by mean group estimation, which basically you estimate each separately and average, or you pool. That's a pooled estimator. You basically pool in all the countries and estimate one estimate for the long run coefficient. We do both. This is the average of individual. This is the pooling uh, effect. Uh, and then we set the lag order t to power 1 over 3. Uh, so they deal with that. We have done some Monte Carlo. I don't have time to go over them. The Monte Carlo really satisfactory. It doesn't work well when the, the maximum uh, uh, eigenvalue of the, the part, which is the lag dependent value, goes to 0 0.8, 0 0.9. As I said, in our application, we don't get anything more than 0 0.6 because the growth of output is not highly persistent. So we are lucky. Well, we are not lucky. I knew it's going to happen. Because when I said to them, first look at the growth of output to see across all these economies. For example, if you like the US growth of output, you get a coefficient of 0.3. If you run a regression of US output growth with lag value, you get 0.3. For most European, we get the same number. You get some of the countries, you, you get something like about 0.6 in some uh, Latin American countries. Because of the high inflation they have experienced. So uh, it turns out that uh, for most applications, we, we do reasonably well. Let me now go to the, the, the application very quickly. Uh, so I'm not going to convince you, you read the paper, that these methods actually work in practice. They look complicated. The idea is very simple. Uh, is because you need to allow for dynamics. You need to allow for cross-dependence. And you need to allow for the fact that you get bias estimates if t is short. So basically, uh, the, some of the uh, studies uh, of uh, between inflation and growth, firstly, the direction of the 
uh, affect whether it, uh, growth affects uh, death or death affects growth. Obviously, it's endogenous, and so interactive. Uh, there is a lot of studies in this uh, that we have identified this year. I don't have time to go over them. The most important one nowadays in the debt to GDP is Reinhardt and Rogoff, which was published in American Economic Review and was uh, subject to some debate. Uh, so uh, the same with inflation, the same issues are as inflation. I have already gone to most of this discussion. Let me just go to the data. So the data, we look at CPI, we look at real GDP. We use the CPI to uh, deflate the debt. And, in, and also we have measured the inflation to CPI across countries. We look at uh, uh, the, the, all the countries that is the study of uh, Reinhardt and Rogoff. They published another paper in Journal of Economic Perspective, which they uh, extended the, the, their analysis to some of emerging economies. But the way they did it, they, they separate the study. They didn't put all the countries together. We are going to do it together. Uh, they separately look at OECD countries and the rest. Uh, so we, in this assembly, we also look at uh, many countries uh, that they didn't look at. Uh, so uh, the, the focus on gross debt, that's the issue. Uh, Reinhard, Reinhard and Rogoff also look at gross debt because the data on net debt uh, of the government is uh, not available across our countries. Uh, so uh, our analysis uh, look at the uh, uh, slow heterogeneity issues, so therefore we need enough data. So we make sure that we have at, at least 30 years of data for the countries we include in our sample. Uh, of course, it dropped a few countries. You may say it's a sample selection bias, but that's how life is. You don't have data, you cannot analyze. So it says that those countries we have at least 30 years of data are included in the sample, which we end up at least 40 countries already. So it's still quite a large number. We also make sure that Remember, I have to calculate cross-section average. To calculate cross-section average, I need to have n, enough number of countries to average across them. So we make sure that the number of countries we need to average is 20. These numbers come from Monte Carlo studies we have done. We show that you have about 20 units. You can do a very good job of getting rid of the common effects using by cross-section average. So the idea is basically you average across the number of rooms. Uh, I, uh, I tell my reminder, when I first did a Empirical, you know, mode color analysis. I had to generate uh, uh, normal distribution. Uh, that was many years ago, more than a number of years. I care to mention. And I remember those days we used to uh, average six uniform to get normal. The law of large number, the central limit theory worked for six. Uh, Try it. Uh, average six uniform, you get almost a normal. So you don't need many uh, uh, number of variables to to get law of large number working. The large number stop working when you get fat tail, when you get a lot of outliers. Uh, when, when, when things are bounded, uh, the moments exist, it works. And I think most of this, because we're dealing with the uh, problems which are uh, you know, manageable, uh, especially growth, the, if the debt duty goes above a certain level, the country stops working. You know, they, they have a financial crisis. It would never happen. So therefore, there are bounded variation across this data because of the nature of the world we live in. So that, I think this works. So we have end up with 40 countries. Uh, we have, uh, and then uh, from 1965 to 2010. It's, it's unbalanced panel. Though all countries are not in all periods, but it doesn't matter. The method works if the panel is not balanced. And these are the countries. Uh, most of the European economies are there. I'm sorry that we couldn't put any of the central <laughs> European economies, they, they, they don't meet the criteria, basically. <laughs> maybe, maybe in the future, maybe you, you guys do. Uh, but we have a, quite a, a spread of countries a, across the world. Okay, now, suppose I collected all this data and didn't know any of these complicated econometrics. A lot of people tell me, why do you spend all your life looking at this complicated problem? Life is not, why don't you just, a lot of people just run simple plots. Well, let's do that. This is output growth on one axis, and debt to GDP growth on another axis. You get that a plot, you get the jumble of uh, points. Very difficult to figure out. Do you agree? So we need more complicated things to look at this data. Okay. So one of the reasons that uh, you just can't do anything. You just have to find out how to analyze this relationship. Now, this is debt and inflation. 
The reason is that heterogeneity and dynamics and dependencies. This is our religion. If the world was totally random and there were none of these problems, you would see clearly what's going on. In many examples, you, do, you, could, you could work, but it doesn't work because of these issues. Okay, we need more complicated things. Let's go back to our model then. <laughs> so we have seen this. So this is the model. Now uh, we have learned the theory. These are, so what we do, we run a regression. Now why is output, real output uh, per capita? Sorry, not per capita. This is output because we look at the growth. This is the growth rate. And what are the x's? We put two variables in the x. Uh, this is the growth of debt to GDP, and that's inflation. Why do we use the growth of debt to GDP? Because we want to make sure that everything is stationary in this model. I also consider the case when you put debt to GDP and look at Y and debt to GDP. Uh, let's just do this. So now we have, uh, we have cross dependence. The, the reason why we have cross dependence, we need to deal with it, we need to put cross section averages. So what we do, you put lags of Ys, lags of Xs, Lags of growth rates, lags of the x's, which are the two variables. Now is the vector here. So we've got both variables in the model. And then you have put in the cross-section averages. Notice here it goes from 0 to 3, which basically means uh, L0 means that they put contemporaneous. So what the key is in this analysis is to put the co 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 common co uh, contemporaneous cross-section averages. And then we also run this regression, which is the when you have no lags. Here is a lag y in it. There is no lag y here, but I have put in, uh, I put in the, the cross-section averages and I put in uh, lags of the changes in x in here, which wasn't in here. So this is the method one, which is a cross-sectionally uh, augmented ARDL. It's ARDL is augmented by cross-section averages. So when you come to implement the ideas, you can tell any second year student to do. So just put in, it's OLS, the model is very simple. You run least square. You just run. Now, of course, I need to choose P. I use three always because I want to make sure that the cross dependence are dealt with efficiently. Now, when we're dealing with the, the second method, which is cross sectionally augmented distributed lag model, the difference between this and that, there is no lag wise in here. You see, there is no lag wise in here. But I put lag changes of X to deal with the fact that I dropped the lag wise. But then the errors are still correlated, but as I told you, by putting these cross-section averages, the serial correlation become unimportant. So we now look at the estimates of the long run, which is directly this one. And the long run here would be uh, sum of the betas divided by minus sum of the phi. So therefore, the long run here is different from here. I need to construct it. But this method gives me the long run directly, theta. OK. So now we look at some of the results. The first result we did was to basically we do, uh, I don't know, maybe you can't see from the back there. But I, let me read it to you, because I don't think I, uh, anyway, I would get it of the. So what, what is this, this table? This ARDL method, one lakh, two lakhs, three lakhs. This is when the A bit is when you put the debt to GDP growth rate, not uh, inflation. This is only when you put inflation, this is when you put both of them. This is first, at the moment, no cross-section augmented, and that's the no homogeneous heterogeneity. So it's like a fixed effect. I usually do this for comparison. Now, if you have two lags and three lags, you get the results very different. For example, if you have one lag in this model, you get, point, you get a negative effect, which is significant, which is good news. It's 0.075 of uh, output growth, the debt to GDP on output growth. But then the, the effect keeps diminishing when you uh, go the number of lags 0.05. It's not very robust to the lag. Uh, second, the, the, the lag dependent variable, which is the sum of all the, the longer is the sum of the, uh, sorry, the sum of uh, basically one minus the sum of the coefficients of the phi, because we have first difference here. So if you look at this one, these are near, not near one, but mm, 0.77, which basically, if you look at the sum of this coefficient, become 0.3. So it's the dynamics is not very persistent, uh, but it's there. But when you look at the inflation effect, it's very small, and but there's still uh, some negative effects. So therefore, the, even these results suggest that there are negative effects from uh, debt to GDP growth and from the inflation. Let me just now, of course, we have to deal with nonlinearity as well, which I haven't discussed. In this, mo in this method, you basically we allow for mean group estimation, but we do not allow for the cross dependence. Again, the results are not doesn't seem robust, but they are the same direction. You get the negative effect. 
I just want to go to the, as we go along, to the cross-section average. So this is the one which allows for the genetic, because it's, it averaged the, all of the different coefficients across countries. It this with the cross-sectional dependence and this ARDL. Now the numbers even rises and is more robust as you go across the lags. The band down got much more a stronger effect. We knew that from the previous result that if you don't allow for the short dynamics, allow for the dynamics and the cross dependence, you underestimate the effects. So you notice the effects have gone up. So if you like the lag of all the three, or if you lag of all the two, doesn't make much difference. It's 0.09, it's higher than before, but it's there. And in particular, the inflation effects gone up. What I still, however, the, sorry, the inflation effect gone down here in this example. Now, still using ARDL. So I wasn't happy about this result, to be honest, because I would have expected that for countries which inflation was more important, you get similar effects that countries were output debt. Because in the long run, whether you finance uh, uh, your deficit by creating debt or by creating uh, printing money, it should not make a difference in the very long run. Because at the end of the day, you have the same effects. Uh, but uh, anyway, it is maybe because we have uh, uh, dynamics here. So we're going to now go the other approach, which we get rid of these, but we put a lot of more lags and put lag differences. So that is that's the second method. So that's the method where we have mean group estimation, now we have cross-section average, but distribute a lag. Notice what happens here, no, now they get even more robust results, but when you go to three lags, and then you go to the joint effects, notice these effects are now almost the same. So therefore, this is the effect of the debt, this inflation. If you, if you do it jointly, you get 0 0.084, 0 0.086. If you go more lags, 0 0.082, 0 0.086. So that is the result. So basically, it really doesn't matter whether you uh, expand the economy you know, in an unsustainable way by creating more and more inflation, or you think about that, actually, these results which are more robust and doesn't need the dynamics. The T is not very large in this example. And that's what suggests the Monte Carlo suggests the same thing. We get very nice result. Both of them of the same magnitude, of the same sign. And it doesn't matter, doesn't, it's quite robust. And there is no lag dependent variable here to problem us, to create problems. So the, the uh, econometrical 2006 paper shows that it's really robust to a lot of its specification. So that is my suggestion that we get, this is the result we have got. Now, very quickly, given the time, uh, so I, I don't have the time to go over it, what about the threshold effect? So when we started, we say, okay, if you want the threshold, let's do what Logov should have done in econometric sense, because what they do, if they look at the paper, they tabulate things, basically. They, they don't really do any econometric analysis. So what we did, we say, look at the growth rate, forget about all the effects we have, we create a threshold, which the indicator, which is one, if the debt to GDP goes above the threshold, because it's a lot of debt to GDP, the threshold is tau. Tau could be 10%, 20%, 30%. For example, he thought that 90% is magic number. Rogoff in that work. They say, if the debt to GDP goes about 90%, you should worry. And when, we, when I presented this IMF, that was very important because they, they thought that's a policy decision. But look at now what happens. So what we do here, we do not allow for the Gini across countries here because I is not here. But we do allow for the effects of the threshold to differ across threshold. Gamma tau. Here we do allow for the Gini across countries. Then we do, then we say, oh, but why do you want to look at the threshold without allowing for the other effects in the model, right? All the things we talked about. Is it crazy to just look at the threshold? So we put in back in the, the debt to GDP growth rate and inflation and also the lag values and also do cross section uh, augmentation. So this is basically going back to what I just showed you, but putting back the threshold to see what happens. Then this one we actually found out that it's important to also to model uh, the interaction between the threshold and the debt. In other words, what it turns out is also important, I'm going to show you, if the threshold is rising, it's important if your GDP is high, is rising as well. In other words, if the threshold, say, 90%, this is much more problematic for a country if the debt to GDP is rising rather than the falling. So basically what it says that we look at the interaction of the threshold effect with the maximum of zero and the growth rate of debt to GDP. If the growth to GDP is falling, we say the threshold doesn't matter. If the GDP is rising while you're above the threshold, it matters. We'll see whether it's true or not. Let's just see the result. 
Let's quickly look at the results. Now, the first result shows that this is the Rogoff model without heterogeneity. So <coughs> what is here? Yes, the threshold is, uh, is important, but it's important everywhere. There is no particular threshold effect. 10%, 20%, 30%, 40%, 50%. So notice here, the problem is quite complex because as you increase the threshold, the number of countries in sample dropping. So there's a sample selection about endogenously. In other words, imagine you take the threshold to 150%, nobody left, maybe only Japan. So therefore, the, you cannot really identify the effects of it. Now, when we allow for the uh, heterogeneity, you get, the, again, it's there, but uh, it could be not, very, not that very different. Look at the coefficients are rising. So there is a point that the negative effect of going above the threshold rises and the threshold rises. But remember, these, these regressions do not include the common effects and all the things I talked about. So what happens if you put them in? So these are the regressions where you put in the, the, the growth effects. What happens to threshold? Totally not there. Gone. No threshold effect as such. If you only look at the threshold, and let's just remind you, here there are no excess in the model. They're just simple uh, regression without any growth of uh, GDP, uh, inflation, or any other lag values. No lag, nothing. So obviously the model is specified. So you're attributing missing variables to this threshold effect. But as soon as you put them in, the threshold effect disappears. Now, is there no nonlinearity? That's why we introduced the, third, the final result, which is interaction. What it turns out, if you put the interaction, which is the coefficient plus coefficient, notice here, you get significant effects when the threshold goes above 90%. So therefore, our conclusion is that it is not per se the threshold which matters. It differs across countries. What matters is if you are above a threshold and your debt to GDP is still rising. So therefore, the market looks at you. You say, these guys are above the threshold, but they are not putting their house in order. I don't see any evidence of reversal. So they would attack you as a financial crisis or something. And then, then your growth will go down because you cannot finance your, uh, your uh, trade. What happens if you are other countries, you, you basically your inflation rises. doesn't matter. One way or another, you will not be able to m maintain your economy. So what, the, what we found, that's why Rogoff likes it, what we found that actually there is a threshold effect of 80-90%, but only for countries where when they reach that, they're still, their debt to GDP is still rising. But if you are 80% or 90% and the debt to GDP start falling, the market says you are equilibrating, why should I worry about you? So it's not just a threshold. So just to conclude, anyway, these are all uh, uh, the effects when we add more, uh, 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 get rid of the, suppose we now, in this model, we included this already, See, because it's significant. So in this model, we just say, let's just drop that. Do we, does it disappear? No, become even stronger, you get this effect. So that is it, now the number rising, is actually peaks around about 80%. If you take these, uh, the estimate to literally, there is an 80% threshold for those countries where the debt to GDP is still rising at that threshold. But if the debt GDP is falling at that threshold, it's not a problem. Because they're not there. The only this part, if conjunction of effect, if your debt GDP rises about 80% and your, this maximum is positive. But if the debt GDP is not growing, is declining or is stable, this is zero. So there is no effect here. So just to conclude that we, we basically uh, we looked at this relationship, it's quite complex because of all the issues I told you. The scatter graph also showed you how difficult it is to figure out what the hell is going on in this data. But by really using the techniques carefully, allowing for understanding of interconnection world economy, and understanding the political dynamics of the debt management, the threshold effect basically, that if you are in debt and your banker sees that you are not changing your lifestyle, and you continue your debt to rise, they are going to screw you up. And you're going to pay for it. And that's the conclusion. Okay? I'm sorry that I went somewhere too fast, but I thought I want to fit the time. Thank you very much.
please, any, any questions or, or comments? Do you have any questions? Can you can you calculate country specific thresholds? No, mm. no, it's not possible. I mean that's the problem uh, because if you look at uh, the reason is that uh, you, you you allow for you you're looking at the cross sectional uh, relationship to be able to identify this effect. Suppose I look at one country, I need to be able to have long enough series which they want different threshold. Like for example, I need to look at uh, the only country is the U.S. And then you look at this, that you see there have been uh, sometimes about 10%, 20%, 30% and been there, and then different growth experiences. is almost impossible. But I think this is the nearest we come to figure out what happens to a particular country, uh, you know, in, in some measure. And I think it's reasonable. I mean, for example, we do as in our lifestyle as well, we, we only live one life. When we marry, we look at what others did when they marry, what happens to them. That's why we like news from about others. So basically, learning about others helps us to understand our own problem because we cannot possibly look at our own personal experience to figure out what happens to us. So I think this is not an unusual problem. But it doesn't mean we don't learn anything from it, but you have to be careful that it may not be applicable to that particular country. Look at Japan. There are exceptions. But if you look at Japan, they never got the... the, the they've been stable. The, the people agree that the 170 percent, whatever it is, but then their debt to GDP is not either rising very much or falling. In fact, they want. In fact, in Japan, people like uh, they inflate their economy. In fact, one of the policy uh, successes of recent government in Japan was they in increased the inflation target. <laughs> so they're, they're basically that's reverse of the problem. So basically, they want to see the growth happening, uh, and therefore they are not worried too much about the debt in that. So even in that, it fits in with this sex level, but you cannot possibly estimate individual specific target threshold. Another questions, please. Uh, there were several times used uh, the word robust or robustness. Uh, is this an experience from a numerical analysis or there are some measure of uh, robustness of, of estimating methods? It's a good point because when I use the word robustness, I meant in terms of both Mount Carlo studies we have done. Uh, I didn't have time to go over them, but it's a good opportunity just to flash some of those points. And then I come back to the empirical section. Uh, here are the questions that we raised. For example, we said, what if, if you had a, a distributed lag ARDL, but the lag orders were not what we thought it was? In other words, miss, what are the misspecific issues we make? The, you, you, you misinterpret the dynamics, so you get the wrong lag orders. What it turns out, the misinterpreting the lag orders are not important for the, the second method I explained, which you don't, don't use any lag values, but it's important for the, uh, the ARDL method. Right? We saw, for example, is the, the system, how sensitive our analysis is to the maximum degree of persistence. So we saw as you go to 8.8.9, .8 you get problem. So if you apply these methods to a problem which is very persistent, you should be careful. You should, but you should, maybe you should use this CSEL method. Uh, so then the other one, the, this method is robust to number of factors. We don't know how many factors there are, how many common factors there are. Uh, the method is robust to that. We don't know what the serial correlation it is. The second method is robust to that. That is why I relied, in my conclusion, the second method. We have done a lot of Mount Carlo studies <laughs> to make sure that we understand the dynamics of this and robust is that. But as I explained, in some problems like uh, heterogeneity, you cannot allow for everybody, depend on the problem. So we, we, I think we are, we are, I'm really confident that this analysis is very robust because we, we didn't choose a particular set of countries. The way you see the way I did it, I said we want all the countries, we have data, we have at least 30 years of time periods because of the dynamics estimation and cross-section dependence 20. Then, to, to that extent, we have reduced the, uh, if you like, the uh, sample selection bias affecting these results. Uh, and I think they are reasonably robust. The second method is reasonably robust. But the first method is less robust. Another question, please. I have a question. Sure. You, made, you made an analysis on gross rates of data. It means they are stationary with data, with majority. 
and then you made the analysis on level data. Is there some difference in interpretation to results? Because statistically, the data have different uh, properties. No, not for the long run. Because remember, if you take the, let me just, uh, I think good, good, very good question. We have it in the paper, but I didn't have time to go over it. Maybe it's in here somewhere. Uh, here we are. So this is what we did. So we also did uh, exactly what you suggest. So we, we, this is the uh, output. Uh, mm -hmm. This is not growth rate. This is the, just the log of output. Uh, and then uh, this is the x, which is the debt to GDP and price level. Mm -hmm. So because in order to do this, you have to look at the price level, debt to GDP, and the output, right? Mm -hmm. So that's what exactly what we did. And again, if you put the large values, because the, the, the dynamics is very complex now, more complex, and they didn't need a unit root. So that, that was the, remember what I answered the question? So we can't estimate this by ARDL, because the roots are near unity, and it's not clear with work. So what we did, we estimated it by method of the, the second method, which is basically we get rid of the dynamics and just run a regression of y on x. This is a new method. Nobody has suggested try this so they don't know it works, but it would work. So I put only x's here and no lag y. Can you see? There is no lag y. So I don't do co-integration anymore. Well, I want to estimate the long run. Why do I care about the lag y? Because I got rid of the lag y. Okay? Now, if you do that and estimate the model, you, you, what do you get? You get the coefficients of the, obviously more, uh, 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 not as precise, but you get negative, again, minus 0.05 effect here. So you need to put enough lags, but notice here that when I put, uh, you know, there's some sensitivity to the lags, but it's in the, the same ballpark. If you look at the standard errors, it's higher. If you multiply the standard by two and add it plus or minus, you get the coverage probability of this exactly what we had before. But it's less precise. But if you are interested in the long run, the, I could have gone back to this model, this model, and I'll take first difference. Mm -hmm. You get back to what I've already got. But if I take first difference, I just set a correlation in here, but my method is immune to serial correlation. Mm -hmm. So therefore, this is, the best, uh, data. this is the best result I can offer, even if you allow for your yeah. unit. Yeah. Okay. So okay. The th the, I think it's very important. So let me, uh, again, do, do, this is what you had in mind, right? Basically, this is the model you had in mind. Bec I, I got rid of the lags. But if I take first difference of that, I go back to other model. You may say, well, what happens when I get delta E? I get serial correlation, but I've already dealt with serial correlation. I think the problem is people don't understand in a panel, when you put cross-sectional averages, serial correlation is not important. Mm -hmm. If you don't believe me, read the proofs of 2006 paper. That's people don't see why. I've already given you the reason. That is really important discovery. Right? Because single time series analysis is subject to a lot of problems. Because of unobserved effects, serial correlation in the errors, you don't know how to deal with them properly. But when you need a panel, because we use the averages of the rest of the world, as it were, as a proxy for what we are missing, it gets rid of those. That's the magic. And that's why it works. You see, that's why uh, I'm not worried about, that's why I, I knew the results will recover. So basically, that's the reason. But there's a good question. It's in the paper, but we didn't, I didn't have time. Good job you mentioned. Uh, please, another question to have. From thinking a little bit about the policy implications of the results, if I understand it correctly, it means that the thresholds are not very, not very robust. So that uh, there seems not to be a robust threshold, meaning that uh, having the debt ratio over, let's say, 90% of GDP should be harmful for growth and so on. Should it mean, the, or does it mean that we should uh, design the fiscal rule in, rules in completely another way than we are doing it nowadays, meaning that we are considering the thresholds, uh, say, let's for, for example, 60% of debt to GDP ratio and then you should apply restrictive fiscal policies. So should we use another approach based on your results? In fact, we spend a lot of time thinking about the actually answer your question. Again, I didn't have time, but this is uh, the summary of our understanding of this result. The first thing is what it says that, uh, it, it go back to your point, you are right. Notice here, our results also show that there is no simple common threshold for all government debt, right? That's exactly right. That was my answer to the question which was raised. 
But it doesn't mean that because there is not a, the same common threshold across countries, doesn't mean that countries would not suffer if they go above their own threshold, okay. whatever that threshold is. So, but however, what it says, if you go above the threshold, whatever that is, which I don't know what it is. I mean, I, I couldn't figure it out. That's admitting the, the defeat on that. But whatever that is, now if your debt to GDP rises above whatever level it is, but it keeps rising, you're going to sooner or later come against the problem of confidence and crisis, both internal and external. That I'm sure of from this data. So th that you have to be. But if the debt GDP rises and you, what is the right policy? The right policy is that business cycle, debt GDP rises, like it happened in Europe. They shouldn't have done what they did, right? They screwed up in my view. In my view, they screwed up. Now, uh, if you want to be a political statement. So why do they screw up? Because they worry too much about the business cycle effect of debt GDP rising. And they treated this the same across all European economies. Even England, you don't have much of a problem start tightening their economy. So what happens by tightening all of those economies, you postpone the recovery. You postpone the debt to GDP from falling back, right? Because of the, the, the rise of the GDP is cyclical. So the answer is that what you need to do, what's the lesson from my simple lesson that I can offer, is that you should always know that you cannot go above a limit in your economy. And if you see you are going, and people are worried about it, like whatever it is, as soon as they worry about it, it means you are reaching the limit, right? As soon as they worry about it, you should announce within two years or three years, we, we, we know why we are higher than normal, because of business cycle factors, we definitely want to bring it down and provide a credible a statement of a physical and monetary policy which bring the debt GDP down over the next two or three years. Okay. That's, the, that's the, my conclusion. And another question? Uh, perhaps another one, uh, just to the technical point. Uh, what is exactly the role of the common factor there and how it, uh, what is the impact for the result? If it is possible to summarize it somehow, somehow into it. See, the, the, the role of a common factor, I mean, I don't know, uh, we are familiar with the literature on panel data analysis, more recent developments. Now, Remember when you have a panel? It's a good question again. Forget about all these complicated expressions. What is a panel? The panel is composed of I and a T here, and the error EIT here, right? Now, imagine uh, EIT and EJT are correlated with each other, right? Now, why is the what we call it cross-sectional dependence? In other words, what happens if the error of one country depends on another? Well, it happens because countries are adjacent to each other, right? The spillover effects. Like, you guys are your near neighbor. You would be obviously trade with each other. And any shock happens in one country would manifest itself in another country. In Finland, it's a good example. When uh, there was a crisis in Russia, because most of the trade with Russia, the Finnish economy was suffered more than any other countries in the other region. Right? It happened. So some of it is the spillover effects. Some of it is that both countries are subject to a shock. Imagine something happened in the China, both countries are affected. We cannot separate, and in this model we don't need to, whether the effects are local, spatial in other words, or the effects are global. Now, what we do there, we put these factors in. And these factors try to capture this dependence. Now, these factors could be many diverse reasons behind them. This analysis does not try to identify it. Now, you could, you could take this analysis and ask yourself, what are those factors and what are their natures? What do I have to do? I have to estimate these parameters now. I, I have a more complicated task. I have to estimate all these parameters. Not this. I have to go back to this model. Sorry. I have to estimate these, these, these parameters. Having estimated these parameters, then go back to original model. I have the factor model. OK, here we are. Now, remember, I have estimated this coefficient from the cross-section augmented pattern. So I now can estimate UT. If I estimate UT, it means that now I can find out from UT what are the factors. People are doing it. For example, I have a paper working on to estimate this model first, then go back, find the U, 
And then from that, where you find out what the factors are, like principal component analysis. So you can go back to the factors, but that requires you first estimate the phi and beta consistently to be able to estimate you consistently. Having estimated you consistently, then you can ask yourself, what is the nature of dependence in you? Is it local? Is it global? Is it interaction? Which is more important? So that's the more factor analysis. You know, I can give you even the data on you, you have the same problem, right? Suppose I gave you the data on you. You have this problem of what are the factors in you. So there's a big literature on looking at the principal components and factor analysis, which you can use, or discriminate analysis. So the methodology we develop allow you to estimate these coefficients consistently, but then you can go to. But notice here, the trouble with this is that we need to have enough large T now to be able to estimate the dynamics consistently. I cannot use the second method now anymore. Because the second method convolute the factors, the cross dependence with everything. So I have to go back. Unfortunately, you need T about 50 or 60 observation to be able to apply these methods if the coefficient of the phi is on near unity. This is why I like robustness we talked about. But basically, you need to understand the methodology and see what is its limitation and then apply it uh, correctly rather than blindly. The trouble is a lot of people apply these methods without thinking about the underlying assumptions. So you can go there for, go back to this. I have a paper with Elisa Tossetti, who worked on a special models with me in uh, Journal of Econometrics 2011, which we actually show that you can estimate these use consistently and then analyze them. Okay, Professor Bessarano, thank you. Thank, thank you very you. much.